Well, s- sticking with um, the question of defining the truth, let's talk a bit about COVID disinformation. Um, it was emerged, it emerged at the weekend thanks to a Telegraph investigation um, along with Big Brother Watch, the Civil Liberties campaign group. Um, th- the authorities were monitoring lockdown sceptics to an even greater extent than we had already known and passing their information onto social media and having some of their posts downgraded or, or, or deleted. Um, Tom, I mean, what have you made of these kind of latest revelations? Well, it's building on some work that Big Brother Watch have been doing for some time now. Um, and essentially particularly going to kind of public figures, prominent critics of lockdown and asking them to do uh, essentially various different kind of forms of access requests it, in terms of the information that the government had stored on them. And mm. um, there was a report that they brought out a few months back on this whole kind of broader ministry of truth, these various different disinformation units within government, even within the British Army, um, which were collecting reports, lists, um, posts um, from prominent lockdown sceptics um and this is the sort of latest front in that i think what the latest revelations which relates to a bunch of individuals but um ones that will be known to spike readers and listeners of course carl hennigan from oxford university center for evidence-based medicine and molly kingsley from us for them which was the campaign group which we were against school closures mm. very effective during the pandemic um and the examples that they found that were collected by these disinformation units which were in the cabinet office as well as the culture department uh were things so in molly's case it was a tweet which said that closing schools was unforgivable Mm. by any reasonable definition how is that disinformation willfully spreading false information which is what it's supposed to mean in the case of carl hennigan remembering that he's a professor of evidence-based medicine he had questioned the evidence behind the rule of six which was one of those kind of nonsensical back of a fag packet covid rules that we've tried to forget at this point and the second lockdown, mm. very much within his wheelhouse, you might think. Yeah. Um, he's not a malign <laughs> actor. He's not a bad actor in any stretch of the imagination. Um, and yet this is, was compiled as part of these reports. So I think it just adds a bit more detail and a bit more colour to what's been exposed and coming up for some time, which is that during the pandemic, you had that kind of pre-existing sort of post-2016 panic about disinformation just be put on steroids. And also it starts to have real consequences in terms of how government was turning work and tools that were often only previously used in relation to kind of hostile foreign actors and things like that on their own domestic populations. Um, The big question, which is um, hovering over all of this, is how much did this actually lead to social media censorship? Um, So obviously people like Carl Hennigan and Molly Kingsley both had their brushes with big tech censorship. Um, The government has refused... Um, has rejected the idea that they had anything to do with that censorship in those two cases. But they have, the Telegraph and Big Brother Watch have found freedom of information requests from one of these units, the now defunct rapid response unit, saying that it had asked for posts to be taken down. The culture department has what they call trusted flagger status, so they can request um, of the social media firms that certain posts be taken down and those will be fast-tracked. So... At the moment, again, not it, it, there's a lot of kind of circumstantial evidence as well as some much more damning evidence. But even so, whilst we wait for more to come out, that general dynamic between government leaning on the social media firms, we've seen it time and time again. And I think you'd have to be incredibly naive to think that that wasn't a relationship that they used to the fullest during the lockdown, given all the things that we're starting to know now. Yeah, and, and Candice, I mean, doesn't this go on to show that the word disinformation has, has nothing really to do with lies and truth, but are you on the correct side of the argument as far as the state sees it? Yeah, it's lost all meaning now. I mean, anything, it's just, it. it's dissent is now framed as disinformation. I mean, this is what everyone was saying when the Big Brother Watch re- report first came out, just people questioning lockdown were now being flagged under disinformation, misinformation. And I think we know that now. It's almost like um, there's the, the understanding of people being good people, but just disagreeing about something is lost. It's it's for or against. It's black and white. And it amazes me that, you know, people in these very powerful positions like Oliver Dowden were involved in this. Yeah. You know, I mean, these are these are leaders in democratic countries doing incredibly undemocratic things with seemingly no understanding of it. And it's interesting that, you know, skepticism of lockdown is considered disinformation especially you know if you look at some of the evidence but that's been emerging later on in the pandemic you know now that we've had a chance to look back um particularly looking at excess deaths it's interesting because that doesn't you know that if you look at that kind of figure it 
ignores the problems with counting COVID deaths. Some governments overcounted, some governments undercounted, things like that. And it seems pretty clear from 2022 onwards, around 2023, looking back, that there's just no correlation between the stringency of lockdown and the number of excess deaths from the panic from the pandemic. And you know what's extraordinary is that in every measure, Sweden, which famously didn't have a lockdown, comes out really, really well. So you know, who is spreading disinformation? Is it is it the people arguing that lockdown is this brilliant you know tool f- um, and should be exercised at every opportunity? Yes, exactly. I mean, that could just be reversed so easily. And I remember the way Sweden was absolutely monstered hmm. for taking that position. I mean, it, people were making out like they were almost trying to kill their population yeah, I mean, yeah. there was no sort of um, appreciation of okay they're trying something different I mean there was just this horrible atmosphere of conformism that took over and because we were all in our homes and we were relying on social media that was the only means we had of communication it made it doubly sinister that we mm. could even all be surveilled in that instance in our disagreements and people could be censored like that. I mean, it was really frightening, actually. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people, I mean, maybe that's just because, you know, obviously we talk about free speech so much is why I am so alarmed by it. But it's always amazing to me the way people go, oh, well, it's just not a big deal. You know, whatever. You know, they were just protecting us at the time. <laughs> oh. Well, it's, it, it, again, it shows the dangers of assuming you know the truth, the dangers of censorship, assuming that an authority has this higher you know, insight into what is true and what is false. Mm. No, I th- I completely. And, you know, allowing the government or a corporation or whoever to be the Ministry of Truth is obviously a dreadful idea, not least because they're really bad at it. They're even yeah. worse than anyone. You know, you could pick five people off the street and they'd be better at guessing where the evidence might be leading than a lot of these chumps at this point. But what I think was interesting about the- these particular cases as well, and-, and you've mentioned this, Candice, is that a lot of the time we are just talking about dissent here. So a lot of the people who had information collected on them Molly Kingsley or David Davis is another one. He was very careful about not really making, not engaging in any kind of um, armchair epidemiology. Yeah. So he opposed vaccine passports on broadly kind of civil libertarian moral grounds, mm. if you see what I mean. Um, many other people have made similar points, and yet they still find themselves being logged. You know, there is nothing, again, trying to, en- you know, they're not even trying to engage in the information, the data such as it is. They're trying to make yeah. moral political yes. points. Yeah. And still they were put into this bucket. So I think it does demonstrate, as you were saying, Candice, that. The war on disinformation is, by this point, if it wasn't already, quite obviously just a war on dissent. And so we just need to, if not retire that term, at least remember what it actually means and recognise what people are doing when they try to deploy it in all of these ridiculous circumstances. I don't know if you guys were familiar with the oncologist Vinay Prasad. He was very much an opponent of lockdowns in America. And he was saying as well, you know, a lot of these people doing the censoring on social media you know, what exactly are their biases and prejudices? We need to understand that. Mm. And he actually looked into someone who was involved with that um, in on Facebook. And he found that this person had very strong beliefs a certain way. And they were censoring people who had the opposite beliefs. I mean, they weren't even pretending to be objective at all. There was abs- That's the problem. You know, there's all these, these scrutiny of the so-called lockdown mm. critics. And I know this is <laughs> it's quite a juvenile point, but who is watching The Watchmen? Yeah. Who are these people in, at Facebook and Twitter who are deciding what we can and cannot see? I think there was a discussion that came out in the Twitter files as to whether they should censor Donald Trump for saying we shouldn't be afraid. I mean, again, you know, that's an opinion. Yeah. It's not. It's not a. It's not a statement of um, falsehood. Yeah. It's. It's a view, but it's a view that you're not allowed mm-hmm. to hold. Yes. Yes. And there's so little recognition of that now, and that's something that we need to recapture. That you know, the, this ability for people to just have opinions and disagree strongly, but appreciate the difference. 